<clears throat> All right. Recording. Um, what's this thing called again? The Life and Times of Jesus and Buddha? Yeah. Is that what we're calling this group? I think so. Uh, the Lifetimes When Jesus and Buddha Knew Each Other Book Club. Yep. It's the Christian and Nathan show starring Christian and Nathan. And today we're going to be talking about... Oh, oh, the screen won't go away. Let's see, chapter three, A Time as Hindus. So I'll just start out by reading this. There are two eternal paths. One is light, the other is dark. The first leads to freedom from the wheel of death and rebirth. The other leads you here again. The real is never not, the unreal never is. Ta-da. Yeah, that line so, is quite fascinating. <laughs> What'd you say? That line is fascinating to me. Like coming out of the bag of the um, I had a, I had a coworker that I read that to recently and she's from India and she's like, I've heard that before. And I'm like, yeah, you probably did hear it before because um, you know, so it comes out of your book, you know, like your Bible basically. <laughs> what, uh, what is the source of the Bhagavad Gita? Like who supposedly wrote it? Well, actually, I don't really know. I'm sure it's like pretty old and multiple people wrote it. Uh -huh. Who's Shankara? Shankara. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about that too. <laughs> they seem to <laughs> jump. They seem to jump into that. Like we all, like that character was introduced before, but I don't know. Yeah, it, it, well, yeah, that's right. Shankara was mentioned in another one. Advaita Let's see if I can find it here. I thought it was going to maybe be in this Wikipedia entry for the Bhagavad Gita, but yeah, it's not. Advaita Vedanta. So it so Shankara probably wrote the Advaita Vedanta, which was non-dualistic, like pure, okay. purely non-dualistic. I bet, and then. I bet either that was in the Bhagavad Gita or a part of it or related yeah, okay. to it. Right, it says an early 8th century Indian philosopher and theologian who con consolidated the doctrine of Advaita Vedanta. Hmm. Unifying yeah, and establishing the inference of Hinduism. Like Bill Thetford used to call A Course in Miracles the uh, Christian Vedanta, you know, because it's a pure non-dualism uh, wrapped up in a Christian wrapping paper, you know, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so what should we do? Share some stuff about the chapter? Man, this one was so good to me, Christian. Uh, I'm from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I've oh, yeah. been a part of this group for a while and uh, really enjoying it. I'm excited about today's call because, um, to be quite honest, I haven't really been following along um, with the chapters, except I did just kind of like skim through this one, read the book two and a half times. Uh, but this has, a, I think this actually is my favorite chapter out of the book. Um, <clears throat> I just, uh, I, I'm, I used to do practice Kriya Yoga and uh, always been a fan of like autobiography of a yogi. And uh, even actually the, the, the quadrant of the city that I live in also is heavily influenced by Indian culture. Um, my favorite episodes of a TV show called Departures where they travel around the world. <clears throat> my favorite episodes were the ones where they went to India. So I have a fascination with that culture and I just like, I, I, I'm excited about this chapter because it talks about uh, a lifetime where Jesus and Buddha were named uh, Harish and Padmaj. And uh, the chapter, as Nathan said, is called A, um, a Time as Hindus. So <clears throat> I, I just like, I can envision, I can sort of like really like um, visualize as I'm reading this chapter, what it looked like um, 2,500 years ago in India and with the orange robes and stuff. So. Uh, yeah, that's why I'm excited. We'll get more into cool. that. Should I? I'm Nathan Lively. I'm in Minneapolis. Um, I'm excited about today because there's a lot of stuff in this chapter that 
was perfect timing for me. Wow. Um, so Christian, do you want to, I don't know, say a couple of things from the chapter that you liked? <clears throat> yeah, for sure. So my highlights for this chapter, one of them was on page 44. <clears throat> Okay, here it is. So I'm just going to start reading here. So um, this is where you want to realize, this is Artin speaking. This is where you want to realize that people are thrown by the ego to be a certain way. They are all the way that they are because that's the way they're supposed to be in order to have the experiences they've been set up for. And they don't know why because it's all unconscious. You know, so let's say you were born today in Canada and when you're six years old, you start playing the game of hockey. Of course, you don't know why you just love it. You keep playing. And over the years, you get really good at it. Good enough that one day you become a professional player. Nothing in the world interests you as much as the game. Yes, you have a personal life, but it's the, so it's the sport that enthralls you. This happens because it's supposed to, and this is the way it is with all people, their professions and the things they're most interested in. They are thrown to live out a script and nothing can stop it. You know, like I find a lot of the, even I, I, I see this like being a part of my life too. Like, it's almost like I can't control the illusion, you know, and uh, nothing can stop it. They said, so do you remember when you, they go on to say how Gary um, <clears throat> doesn't really have anything to do with guns or weapons because he had an ex experience when he was young where a friend of his showed him a gun and uh, he never really spoke to him again. And Arts and Empress are going on to say like, well, you weren't supposed to, you know, you had a past life where um, you died in World War II. And um, so unconsciously we're kind of like controlled, you know? So it's so easy to lose sight of these like um, metaphysical basic premises, you know, because we're so like um, wrapped up within the illusion, hey? Yeah, that, that part that you just read meant a lot to me too. And I kind of saw it as there's no guilt around the place that you're at in your life right now. I mean, you're just uncontrollably sort of drawn to certain things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And that, like there was a time, like as you all, you know, I, I play poker and um, there was a time after my first like year and a half of of studying and practicing that I won all these tournaments at the casino and uh, it was like it I, I, I was walking through the casino after like winning like four days in a row and wow. like, thinking like how all this hard work paid off uh, I'm really a great player but I'm walking through the casino and then all of a sudden I get this realization or I get hit with something and it was basically like but is that it is that <laughs> no, like, <laughs> you know it's not good enough and um i thought that might be enough for me to like stop but i've tried making only the course my life too and that doesn't work either so it's good to kind of like maintain um normal relationships and do normal things you know like the guy i love in the disappearance of the universe where Artin and person is saying get excited gary go trade the markets you know uh, a simple trend following method would be wiser, rather, you know, <laughs> right. it's, pretty, it's pretty cool to, uh, um, like, I'm not afraid to train harder in poker now. So I've been, I've been really focusing and that's probably why I haven't really been following along with the chapters because I feel like I, I, I need to put in like full time in that right now. Plus, um, so yeah i have a couple more highlights but do you want to go ahead and throw out a highlight yeah we can just take turns um so my favorite one this is perfect for me christian because this last last week i was just like all kinds of messed up trying to figure out what to do about my business and so it was just perfect timing to read this um believe it for just one instant and you will accomplish more than is given to a century of contemplation or of struggle against temptation. Um, basically him explaining this idea that I need do nothing as, as 
in, I don't have to do anything. And so this past week, I've been really trying to embody that idea of, well, if I don't have to do anything, then, then what will I do? And if I let myself be guided by the Holy Spirit, then what will I do? So this whole section here um, on after that, to do nothing is to rest and make a place within you, that kind of stuff I've really been thinking a lot about. <clears throat> so, that, and, you know, that's just a few pages into the chapter. So I think that was, that was definitely my favorite part. Yeah, and I, I, you notice that like the entire page is devoted to this whole section in A Course of Miracles. Here is the ultimate release which everyone will one day find in his own way at his own time. You do not need this time. Time has been saved for you because you and your brother are together. This is the special means this course is using to save you time. Um, and I like how, you know, like to do anything involves the body. And if you recognize you need to do nothing, you have withdrawn the body's value from your mind. Um, when I was younger and first heard about the course and first heard about quantum physics and how like the universe doesn't exist, like I was really able to kind of like internalize and generalize that and kind of like in a way deny the ability of anything not of God to affect me and just kind of like really sort of generalize and like you said uh yeah to really like kind of like feel like I need do nothing like it was so hard set on my mind that like if this really doesn't exist and if I'm really not this body how can it affect me at all and I was good at living that way until a big forgiveness lesson <laughs> and I came right back to like <laughs> yeah but I like how Gary, like when I asked him about motivation and stuff, I really like how he said, like, the way you feel um, today isn't how you're going to feel next year, you know, like, and those phases don't last forever. Yeah. Like, you know, I've been there. I've been through that stage, he said. That was a really nice conversation, by the way. Yeah. Did you have something else to add about I need do nothing? Um, I know you mentioned it in that phone call too with Gary. Yeah. I mean, that's what was funny. Cause I mentioned it in that phone call because it just come up for me just reading the course. So it was funny that it just came up for me on that phone call. And then just now when I really needed it, it came up for me in this chapter. So, uh, yeah, not, nothing else to say about that. It was just perfect timing. Very cool. All right, I'll throw out a highlight. Um, <laughs> and I never write in my in my paper books. I never write or highlight anything in them. But I did. Uh, tech. I did put a little star here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. So Harish and Padmaj, Jesus and Buddha. Uh, a time as Hindus, finally meet a teacher that they really wanted to meet. Uh, and he's the teacher with no name. Uh, he basically didn't like to be called any name because he's not a body and he's very non-dualistic. <coughs> we'll simply refer to him as O, Artin says. Uh, it would be three months before O actually spoke to Harish and Padmaj, and uh, he explained how the most important bodies in the story they thought of as their lives were completely unreal. Their parents were never really there. They were false images the ego had created to draw them into the illusion of multiplicity. They, as well as their parents, were never really born. They didn't exist. It was all made up. The physical wasn't true. It was all a lie, and their lives were a lie. And if they had children, that would be a lie too, because everything they see that has shape to it isn't true. You know, like this paragraph is so insulting to the ego. <laughs> 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 and when I say that I was able to kind of like generalize or internalize, like this was very clear to me um, mm -hmm. when I first got into the course, right? But I remember when I got this book recently and read it, 
it was a little harder to read this paragraph. So, yes. um, so I guess it kind of shows how I've kind of like veered off of that a little bit. Yeah, every once in a while, there's those just flat out statements that it's kind of like a wake up call, a little slap in the face. Oh yeah, that's right. We're talking about the world doesn't exist. <laughs> and yeah. I don't exist, right? Mm -hmm. um, I like this line about um, Buddhism was considered to be a part of Hinduism or like a sect, just as Christianity originally considered itself to be part of Judaism, not something separate from it. So I'm just, it was interesting to learn that everything came from something else, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, to most people in the Western world at this point, probably Christianity seems like this magic thing that, you know, came from a magic being and just kind of is perfect and, and always existed, but it has a history just like any other um, thing that we have. <laughs> any other religion came from somewhere else. It was a sect and then it broke off. And now there's like a million sex within Christianity as well. So I guess uh, it's just another symbol of separation. Yeah. Yeah, everything is like splitting and separating. That's really, really interesting, actually. Um, so O goes on to... Uh, O spoke, when O spoke with them, with them in private, he told them it was time for them to practice a certain kind of mind discipline in order to consistently think along the lines he had been teaching them. He told them to practice each day by thinking of people not as the bodies they were seeing, which are merely false images, but as the oneness that was beyond the veil. When Harish and Padmaj found themselves making anything in the world real in their minds, he admonished them to stop it and instead think of everything, not just human bodies, but anything as being a thin veil covering the oneness of Brahma. <clears throat> if people did something they didn't like, O told them to pardon them in their minds, not because those people had really done something, but because they hadn't really done anything. <clears throat> wow, that O guy was way ahead of his time, huh? Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> I think all of us are who are reading this and watching this are ahead of our time because there is no time. We're always ahead of the truth is always ahead of time because it's like outside of time, right? Right. <clears throat> and in time seems um so small and um ignorant. You know, duality and multiplicity is just so um ignorant and small it's it's like you know like it, it is the poverty you know right and give up littleness in exchange for magnitude mm -hmm. yeah so i think those were my highlights even though like the whole book should be highlighted right but <clears throat> christian wasn't it great for you to find out that you don't have to take ayahuasca yeah, I just, it's cool that you brought that up because I always knew that, you know, and um, <clears throat> I've had people invite me to do ayahuasca last year, like a very, very VIP person who, oh. yeah, who's actually uh, really interesting. Like we have spiritual discussions and stuff. He, I used to bartend him, uh, for him and uh he he could see the human energy field and see auras and stuff and we used to discuss things with that and uh <clears throat> i felt a connection to him but he invited me to go do ayahuasca or otherwise known as dmt um very powerful hallucinogen um which they discuss here which uh one, one of harisha and padmaj's teachers on their travels was feeding their community ayahuasca so that's why nathan brought this up but uh i never felt like i had to do that i've had many mystical experiences without it <clears throat> um 
I don't know how it would react to my brain. I have a history of some little little minor mental health things and episodes. So I fear doing um, strong things, <clears throat> substances and drugs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm really glad to know that my intuition was getting the best of me and not doing something like that. It's dangerous. Yeah. <clears throat> and some, I, some people do say that like uh, doing DMT uh, eliminates the ego and stuff like that. And there was once where I commented on one of these YouTube videos and I said, uh -oh. like, although the powerful hallucinogen may temporarily suspend uh, most ego effects, it does not undo the uh, tremendous unconscious mass of guilt that we have uh, in our mind and only that can uh, undo the ego. Yeah. It was good for me to hear that. I mean, just, I feel like I knew that as well for myself, Christian, but <clears throat> I have a close friend who's really into drugs and it's been really good for him in terms of having revelations. Um, and so I, when I hear about his stories and adventures, I'm often like, oh man, I wish I could have those kinds of adventures and revelations, but it's never worked for me that way. And it's always been pretty clear to me that um, <clears throat> most drugs could either, could go either way with me. I could have a really bad time and just get sick or I could have a good time. And, and so it's just not ever been a good idea for me. So, but it was good to read, you know, someone saying, Hey, uh, you don't have to do this. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that's the Holy spirit nudging us in that direction. You know, um, uh, Christian, one more thing I was going to say about, um, that I really liked about you need to do nothing is the part about, um, standing in your quiet center while the storm of activity goes on around you. I've been thinking a lot about that this week as well, kind of imagining myself, you know, still in the world, like doing things, doing things with you, and my, working on my business, pursuing growth in the business and the things I need to do there, but not, not reacting out of fear and just continuing to take action uh, in these pursuits, but with less fear and imagining myself not as a body and free of the effects of the actions that I take. Yeah, and I think that that takes <clears throat> being higher up on the ladder. You know, the, the more of that unconscious wad or mass of guilt that's undone out of your mind, the more you'll cultivate that awareness of mindfulness yeah. of, of being above the battleground. So of course it's a process and uh, I'm sure you've had tastes and glimpses and, and I'm getting more as I get older too. So, um, but yeah, uh, we have to get over our resistance too, because uh, the ego doesn't want us to be in that quiet center. No. It want to be on the screen freaking out making it all real yep it's happening lots of drama so speaking of drama christian do you want to tell me your forgiveness in the field um I, actually i i'm gonna have to think about that a little bit but i i remember earlier today um i was gonna get mad at my cat okay <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I stopped myself. I saw myself like, why well, get mad, you know? Um, and, I, and I stopped myself and I turned and went back to work. Wow. And then it was all good. I was like, yeah, like, why well, get mad at a cat? <laughs> <laughs> good one. <laughs> um, so as part of my recovery from last week. One of the things I've done a couple times this week is set a bunch of timers during the day that will sort of go off and remind me to just like take a break and ask for guidance. 
And that was great. Um, today, there was a moment when I was started generating some anxiety about this thing that I'm trying to sell and it's not selling and what's going to happen and money and blah, you know, just kind of spinning around. I'm trying to like, oh, I better like quickly think of some ideas. That timer went off. I took a break and um, remembered to the, my reading for today in the course was about not making, not keeping any private thoughts. So I've been thinking about that and that helped a lot. So I was just thinking about, I don't have any private thoughts. I'm not alone. The Holy Spirit's with me. I'm sharing my thoughts with him. I am him. We're all one. And um, that helped me calm down and stop from probably doing anything rash. Awesome. And uh, it's funny that you brought that up, like setting a timer and stuff. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And that's what it is to be vigilant. And uh, that will absolutely help you uh, become more mindful. And because you were talking about the calm in the storm, and I was going to say that that's one thing I was going to bring up is that like, why do you think the workbook has, you know, these reminders, you know, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour, because that's the ego is so good at reinforcing itself. So that's keeping us on the screen. And then when we return ourselves to that quiet space, I need do nothing. Then yeah, that's, it takes practice. And then I, I guess that's like, how we sort of like build upon the holy instant to stretch out. Agreed. Yeah. Um, cool. Anything else to share from your week, Christian? Um, you know, I don't think so, but I'm really excited about a book by Dr. Uh, Bob, uh, Robert Rosenthal. He, he uh, took on uh, a position as like co-president of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publishers of Course in Miracles. And he's a really cool dude. And I've listened to a lot of his interviews and stuff. Okay. And he has a new book coming out at the end of this month um, called From Nevermind to Evermind. Um, okay. So I'm really, really excited about that. The catchy title. Yeah. <laughs> his first book is called From Plagues to Miracles. The transformational journey of Exodus, um, um, kind of like as a process. The transformational journey of Exodus from the slavery of the ego to the promised land of spirit. Okay, um, it's really awesome, and it's uh, based on a course of miracles. And uh, yeah, so if you want to check out some of those interviews uh, or anybody out there, um, Robert Rosenthal. Dr. Bob. Yeah, I'm looking at it. I'm going to put it on my wish list. Cool. For some reason, I feel um, like when I listen to his interviews and stuff, like it just resonates with me. I've had so many like um, interesting things happen from listening to Dr. Bob and stuff. Mm, cool. All right. All right. I feel like... If anyone's listening to this, maybe we should say some critical or crazy things so people can get some, you know, forgiveness opportunities out of this. I mean, I should probably say that Jared's a terrible person and his uh, parents are terrible people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so in the next week we're doing chapter four, Plato and Friends. Sounds just beautiful. Yeah, Plato and friends. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Um, thanks, Nathan. Thank you, Christian. Um, hopefully I get to meet you in person someday and maybe you can teach me how to win at poker. <laughs> yeah, totally. Sounds good. Definitely. All right. Have a good week. You too, buddy. See you later. Bye. Good night. God bless.